bass trombones. I love them. I love playing them. I love how they sound and I love learning about them because there are so many crazily different bass trombones out there. The one we're looking at today is from 1977 and it's an old custom crafted model P24 Jeep. Let's talk about it. <laughs> It's Sam here from the Samuel Plays Brass channel. I appreciate you tuning in and I hope you're all doing well on this fine day. This is a really awesome review we've got coming up, so make sure to stay strapped in and leave a like if you enjoy. This is a very cool horn, but a fairly uncommon one and not terribly Googleable as far as bass trombones go. So if after this video you find your thirst for knowledge is not yet satiated, I've left a link down in the description to itsabear.com where the author has written a really great page about old bass trombones in general, and particularly this model and a similar one, which is the S24G or their super model. Model. On the P24G, we have a few noteworthy technical specifications. First of all, the primary or slide section bore of the instrument is 0.565 inches in diameter, which is just a hair larger than the industry standard of 0.562 for most bass trombones. And then the valve section bore or the trigger section bore is 0.585. Now, I don't know terribly much about valve section bores on bass trombones. They can range a fair amount, but 585 seems a little bit small to me considering that most con bass trombones, which are a little bit more ubiquitous, have a 0.594 inch bore at the bell section. Now, I meant to say valve section bore, but speaking of bells, that's kind of the next thing to talk about here. This instrument has a red brass bell, which is very cool. It has that nice darker hue to it than traditional yellow brass and it's got a nine inch bell flare. Now that is quite a bit smaller than a lot of modern bass trombones. A lot of bass trombones will have a 9.5 inch flare like the S24G or even a 10 or 10 and a half inch flare depending on how much breadth you want to the sound versus how much directness you would want with a smaller bell. But in any case, nine is smaller than what we see on most. In fact, some Holton tenor trombones actually have a nine inch bell flare, which is on the, on the other side of the spectrum, a little bit oversized from the typical eight and a half flare that we see on most tenors. Aside from the red brass bell section, most of this instrument is made from nickel silver as evidenced by that dark silver sort of hue. This is a dual rotor independent bass trombone, meaning it has several different tuning possibilities. You start off, of course, in B flat. You press your first trigger, of course, you get an F. And then you press your second trigger on its own and you get a G instead of the typical G flat on modern bass trombones. You press both of them together and you get an E flat instead of a D that you would get with a G flat second rotor. So the second rotor is moved up half a step from usual and unfortunately there isn't enough pull on it to be able to pull it out to a G flat or a combined D, which is a little bit annoying so you'd need to have an extension piece made if you really wanted that but the E-flat system is not too bad as opposed to the D system. Both of this instrument's trigger slides are built on a closed wrap system, meaning the tubing loops around on itself a couple of extra times, as opposed to an open wrap system, which is preferred by some modern bass trombonists. What's really interesting about this trigger system is it hasn't got a string linkage like most bass trombones of this era. There aren't any strings to speak of on the rotors. They're actually sort of a mechanical linkage, but made from plastic rather than metal. Much like the Selmer Bolero that I reviewed a while ago, you can find that review up in the card, it's a really cool horn. But where this one differs is it actually has rotating rotor plates as opposed to just the stem. That's a really interesting feature that I don't think I've ever seen on another bass trombone. And it's interjection time, I'll keep this brief, but I haven't been annoying enough lately about my Patreon page at patreon.com slash samuelplaysbrass. There's a variety of reward tiers for fairly low prices, so if you find you've got a couple bucks weighing down your wallet and you want to support the creation of bigger and better content, once again, patreon.com slash samuelplaysbrass. Back to the video. Now, bass trombones can be really tricky to dial in because you tend to have several different horns in one. You have the open horn, and then the trigger one horn tends to respond a little bit differently. The trigger two horn tends to have another sort of subtly different response. And then trigger one and two kind of tend to provide this weird assimilation of response between trigger one and trigger two, all subtly different from the open horn without the triggers pressed down. For instance, Gonzaga University's bass trombone is a Bach 50B3, a really good bass as far as they're concerned. I still need to review that one. But unfortunately, things get a little wonky with the triggers. The second trigger, the G-flat one, plays pretty well, but then the F trigger, the one that you tend to use a little bit more, at least if you're just getting started, like I was in the Gonzaga Symphony, is not as good. So I found myself using that second trigger a lot more in ways that were positively goofy compared to what they would be on the first trigger. The Olds is the other way around. I really wanted to get a lot of mileage out of that G trigger since it's a little bit non-standard, but 
while the F trigger is really solid, that second G trigger is just not quite so much. First position low Gs on trigger 2, and first position low E flats on both triggers just really lacked a confident slot, unfortunately. <laughs> Moving out further on the slide with either of the triggers was just fine. It's just those first position notes that really sometimes don't speak well on one or both triggers. Like I was saying with the G valve, it's a little bit unconventional, but it can be very handy. It provides some interesting alternate positions as discussed by Denson Paul Pollard. Pay close attention to my thumb and my middle finger as well as the slide on these next two excerpts. It's kind of interesting. <laughs> I also don't find the trigger system terribly comfortable. It kind of has my hand at a rather cockeyed angle, and I have to kind of let the bell droop a little bit, which is annoying because if you let it droop too far, then gravity's working against you and it just tips farther and farther. I mentioned that the tubing profile on this trombone is a little bit weird, especially the fact that the bell is so small at nine inches compared to most modern bass trombones, which are 9.5 and up. And I think it's kind of for that reason that this trombone has a more focused and direct and more trombone-like sound than most modern basses. At the very least, it sounds closer on the continuum towards the tenor trombone end than most modern basses would. It handles well on wind ensemble and march stuff, and I don't think it'd be the end of the world on early classical stuff, but I probably wouldn't want this to be my Wagner or Shostakovich bass trombone. Now, if you know me, you'll know that I love that sort of darker brass, that red brass or the rose brass or gold brass or whatever you want to call it. And I do like that red brass bell for sure. And it does provide a nice darker sound at softer volumes. It's just that that darkness is not very well sustained when you step on the gas. And that's when it sort of starts to sound like an oversized tenor. <laughs> So I hope you enjoyed that little review. The P24G is definitely one of the more unusual bass trombones I've played, and it has its quirks and its faults and its weaker spots, sure, but it's a really fun instrument to play, and it's a cool piece of history. It's now coming up on half a century old in a couple of years, and you don't see them too often, so I've really enjoyed playing it. I hope you enjoyed learning about it. Until next time, you can find more reviews in the playlist up in the top right corner. Make sure to check that you're actually subscribed to the Samuel Plays Brass channel. Unlike the vast majority of my viewers, it's a small gesture with a huge impact on the channel, and it keeps you caught up to date with more reviews like this one. Until next time, we'll see you on the flip side. Thanks for watching, everybody. If you want to support the creation of bigger and better content on the Samuel Plays Brass channel, have your name featured right here, and a whole host of other perks and benefits, then please consider pledging your support at patreon.com slash samuelplaysbrass. For now, you can find more videos in the end screen cards to my left.